Check. Yes. Okay. So, welcome to the uh, special lecture. We have uh, Patrick Potts visiting us from Basel. Um, I, I first uh, encountered him when we shared an office in, in Geneva uh, as postdocs. So, Patrick is one of the uh, people with the skill in thermodynamics to both uh, work on the very abstract level as well as have some knowledge of physical implementations. So, I thought it would be useful for him to give you an overview of an autonomous thermal machine with an actual physical system in mind uh, as the rest of the um, courses on really abstract uh, thermo and other stuff. Um, the other thing I would mention, just out of interest, is one of the things we haven't done at all in the course. Um, we, a lot of the thermodynamics course is based on really average quantities, like the average energy change, the average entropy change, and stuff. And one very big field in thermodynamics is actually looking at the fluctuations of these. So you actually look at all of the possible uh, paths and trajectories that the system takes. And Patrick also does a lot of work in, in that fluctuation theorems, uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relations and stuff. So if you are interested, you can always look over his, his works in that regard and stuff. Uh, a final announcement. Uh, this uh, Today, we will have no tutorial. Um, so there won't be a tutorial after class. And we will function, I mean, as uh, on a more relaxed thing in terms of the break and stuff. But yeah, after that, there will be no tutorial. So you might take a bit more time after the lecture ends if you like to ask questions or to talk with Patrick before you go for lunch. Thank you, Patrick. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. So yes, so I'm going to talk about thermodynamics in superconducting circuits, more specifically like thermal machines in superconducting circuits. And as Ralph already said, the idea is to give you a flavor of how these abstract thermal machines can be implemented uh, in real life systems. So I will first talk a little bit about superconducting circuits and what they are and how we model them. Um, this is a pretty short summary of the topic. Of course, superconducting circuits could fill a whole lecture by themselves. So here are three different references that I took to prepare uh, the first hour here. And there's, of course, a lot more information in those if you're interested. Um, but let's start then with, uh, first, what is a, a superconductor? Uh, so a superconductor is a substance that conducts electricity without resistance. <clears throat> so let me write this definition down. And that's actually an extremely useful property because resistance comes with heating and dissipation and dephasing. And since we don't have this resistance, we get away um, really by often describing a system just with a Hamiltonian and unitary time evolution. And we can really design any kind of coupling to the bath. And we, we don't have that, uh, like in, in semiconductors, we have all this problem of heating already that we can't avoid. So here we can, we can design things much more carefully. Uh, yes, and if there's any questions at any point, please just interrupt me. Uh, I'm happy to, to address those questions. So, um, and then the, a really important property here for superconductors is that low energy excitations can actually be engineered. Uh, I, will, I will talk a little bit more about how this works, but this is essentially how we get to design Hamiltonians that then do what, what we want. OK, so then let's first look at what does the ground state in a superconductor look like. Um, so the ground state. And like the most conventional and, and simple to describe superconductors, um, in the ground state, electrons are paired up in so-called Cooper pairs. And these Cooper pairs have an energy which is equal to 2 times 
the chemical potential. So mu is the chemical potential in the superconductor. The exact value doesn't really matter, but uh, all the Cooper pairs do have the same energy. They kind of all condense into the same state. Um, and then we can, we can sketch, sketch this kind of like this. So we have some superconductor, and then the electrons here, they come in these, in these Cooper pairs. Uh, and now we can look at the excitations of this system. Right, I mentioned before that these low energy excitations can be engineered. So first, let's look at the excitations that are naturally present, the ones that, that are there without engineering anything. Well, and then the first thing we can think of is we can break up such a pair and, and really kind of free the electrons which are in that pair. And the energy that this costs is two times delta, where delta is uh, the superconducting gap. And for instance, for aluminum, this is around 82 gigahertz. So these are one of the, the natural excitations that are around in bulk superconductors. We can try to break up these, these Cooper pairs. And then the other natural excitations are density fluctuations. So you can have kind of collective movement of all of these Cooper pairs, which can slosh back and forth. <clears throat> and this occurs with uh, uh, the plasma frequency. Which for aluminum, again, is um, 3.6 times 10 to the 6 gigahertz. Pretty big number. So given that these are the natural excitations in a bulk superconductor, we see that we have a gap here where we can put artificial excitations. And these then allow us, at least at low temperature, to really design a Hamiltonian, an effective Hamiltonian, where we don't have to worry about those excitations because they are at too high energies. Um, and, and the lower excitations we really have designed ourselves. So how can we do that? How can we engineer these excitations? Well, I'm going to talk about two ways how this can be done. And the first way is we can, we can couple two different superconductors. And by coupling them, we create a so-called Josephson junction. So if you want to know more about this here, let me maybe give those references numbers here. So I can tell you where you can find more material on, on different parts of what I'm saying about. Yes. Could you say again when you <coughs> include your plasma frequency? Uh, uh, aluminum as well. Yes. Exactly. Okay, so if we couple two superconductors, well, that um, kind of looks like this. We have one superconductor here, and then we put an insulating barrier here, which is usually denoted by an I. And then we put another superconductor here. And then the Cooper pairs here, they might kind of tunnel from one superconductor to the other side. And we would like to keep track of this tunneling. And for this, we introduce an operator 
n, which is the number of Cooper pairs that tunneled from left to right. Okay. And now this tunneling between the superconductors, we can describe this by a, a tunneling Hamiltonian, where we have some prefactor, where each A is known as the, the Josephson energy. And then we kind of sum over N. Right. So here you see we take this. So, so these n's are the eigenstates of this operator. So this term here would move an additional electron, a, a Cooper pair from left to right. So from an eigenstate n, we go to an eigenstate n plus 1. And here we tunnel the other, the other direction. Um, and now we assume that our superconductors are really big, so that n can take any, any value. So we take the sum all the way from minus infinity to infinity. This is, of course, unphysical in the sense that at some point there's no more electrons around, uh, but it's usually a very good approximation if, there's, if we are dealing with big superconductors because we never get even close to a regime where uh, a superconductor is kind of depleted. <clears throat> okay, and now we're going to introduce a phase operator. which will help us to rewrite this uh, Hamiltonian in a, in a slightly nicer form. And this phase operator is defined in this way. So, if the phase operator is a Hermitian operator, then this is a unitary operator, and one can show that this is indeed a unitary uh, operator, and that allows us, like any unitary operator, can be written as the exponential of i times a Hermitian operator. So this, this serves as a definition here. So maybe I'll put three lines here. Um, and now we can write... And then we get simply minus Ej times the cosine of this phase operator. And this is known as the, the Josephson Hamiltonian, where we have this phase operator. Now, this phase operator has phase eigenstates. Uh, and the phase eigenstates, they are superpositions of uh, all these n eigenstates. So at first this also looks like a very weird operator with these superpositions all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. But it turns out that um, actual superconductors, actual Josephson junctions, are very well described by this kind of operator. So you may have heard that superconductors have a well-defined phase or well-defined phase difference between two superconductors. And uh, it's this operator that tells us this phase difference between uh, the two superconductors. So this is, while strictly speaking unphysical, because it's kind of unbounded from below, this is a very good approximation to describe these Josephson junctions. 
And now kind of the last step that we, that we do here is we may now also apply an external voltage. So we kind of close this here. And then we apply a voltage across those this junction. So this here is a voltage source. And what this voltage does is it shifts the chemical potentials uh, of one of the superconductors with respect to the other. So if you now say the left superconductor has chemical potential mu, the right one has mu plus EV. And now remember that these Cooper pairs, their energy is two times mu. So now if they tunnel, they actually change their energy from two times mu to two times mu plus EV. And so this we also have to take into account in our Hamiltonian. <coughs> so now we say we have these additional terms, 2 EV times N. OK. And so this is the first way how we can engineer excitations in a superconductor. So we connect these two, we allow for tunneling, and the tunneling itself results in this Josephson Hamiltonian, and then we can also apply an external voltage such that on one side the Cooper pairs have a higher energy than the other, and then we add this, uh, this the kind of this local term, um, yeah, which looks like this. So this is the first engineered Hamiltonian that we kind of consider. Oh. Okay, are there any questions to this point? Okay, very good. You can always interrupt me if there are questions. So before we move on to the second way of engineering excitations that I want to discuss, um, let's look at the Schrodinger equation, uh, given that Hamiltonian over there. So the Schrodinger equation, as you all know, simply looks like this. Well, the time-dependent one. Um, and we can actually solve this for this Hamiltonian. I will just write down the solution. That uh, our quantum state is given by an overall phase. which is actually not so important, but I will keep it for completeness because it, it's a time-dependent phase. And then we have a phase eigenstate, but with a time-dependent phase. And this time-dependent phase is given by by the voltage, essentially. <clears throat> and this is actually known as the second Josephson relation. Which tells us how a constant voltage gives rise here to a time-dependent phase. OK, so and this is also kind of what is meant when we say that uh, such a Josephson junction or the superconductors in the Josephson junction have a well-defined phase difference, we can really approximate the system to be in one of those phase eigenstates. But if there's a voltage, then this phase will become time-dependent. Okay, so that brings me already to the second part of how we can engineer excitations in the superconductor. Namely, we can structure the superconductor. So this usually goes under the name of circuit QED. Uh, 
And you can learn a lot more about this in, well, actually all the, all the references, but particularly reference two is a recent uh, review of modern physics. Yes? That's a global phase, yeah. It's a time-dependent one. Um, you kind of need it to satisfy the Schrodinger equation, but it, it's usually not so important. Yeah. Yes? The time dependence of of this one? Ah, yeah, so the phase here becomes time-dependent. So this really comes from the so solution of the Schrodinger equation. If you plug this back in, you find that this is indeed a solution to the Schrodinger equation, but you do have this time-dependent phase. I mean, you have an offset, which is uh, can be arbitrary, but then you do have this 2 EV, so your phase kind of oscillates around 2 pi at, at this frequency, sometimes called the Josephson frequency. Yeah, yes. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then, yeah, let's look at how one can structure the, super, uh, yeah, the superconductor. And so the easiest kind of, well, I, I guess shape is provided by an LC resonator. So we add some capacitance, make some plates here, and then we add some inductance by having some coil. Okay, and then what happens, and we maybe use a different color for that. So what happens is that there is an electric field between these plates. Uh, and that's, that field arises because there's charge on the plate, usually Q and minus Q. But then this thing oscillates. So if there's a charge here and minus Q here, then it will oscillate back so that the charge will oscillate. And on the other side here, through the inductance, that will result in a oscillating current. And this current will kind of induce a magnetic field through this coil. And essentially what we get then is a harmonic oscillator. So the energy in such an LC circuit is simply the charge divided by two times the capacitance. plus, and then here I introduce a flux operator, so this is the flux corresponding to this magnetic field through this, uh, through this coil, divided by two times the inductance L. <clears throat> and these operators, they don't commute, but indeed they have like canonical commutation relations. Uh, yeah, I put h bar to 1 throughout. I, I guess you're, you're used to that. Um, okay, now we can also introduce some additional quantities that turn out to be helpful here. So this LC resonator has a resonance frequency, which is given by 1 over the square root of L times C. And then we're also going to introduce the impedance which is the square root of L divided by C. And with the help of those, of those quantities, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in the following way. Well, using standard harmonic oscillator, using ladder operators, and the ladder operators can here be interpreted as linear combinations of the charge.
plus the flux. And then you will find that these obey the standard bosonic canonical commutation relations. Okay, so a very important part here is by designing such a circuit with a superconductor, we do not have to worry about resistance. We can make a circuit that does not have any resistance, so we can purely describe it with a Hamiltonian, where these observables charge and magnetic field or flux are really quantum observables that do not commute, but that behave like position and momentum in a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and then finally we get this very simple harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian from this, from this structure. And one can of course make more complicated circuits, that's what circuit QED is all about. I mean you can add some additional ingredients here and you end up with a qubit. Uh, but that's not what we're going to do today. So today we're now going to look at what happens when we now combine this object with such a Josephson junction. So let me first draw a, a circuit. So we're going to again have an LC resonator. And then we're going to put this in series with a Josephson junction. So Josephson junction in these circuit diagrams are usually denoted by a, a, an X or a cross. And then, as before, we're going to attach a voltage source to the whole thing. Okay, and now we can kind of combine the two Hamiltonians. So the Hamiltonian describing this circuit is simply the Hamiltonian of the LC resonator. Plus then we have this part from the voltage. And then we have the Josephson Hamiltonian but now we have an additional part which actually couples the two objects. So what now happens is when the Cooper pairs tunnel, they do pick up an extra phase, which is the phase from this LC resonator. So And now, this gives rise to an effect that is known as photo-assisted Cooper pair tunneling. So now we see that if we think of these A and A daggers describing creation and annihilation of photons in, in the LC resonator, then now we have this coupling between these photons and the, the tunneling Cooper pairs. And photo-assisted Cooper pair tunneling works as follows. So let's now say that we put 2 EV equal to an integer number times the resonance frequency of the LC resonator. Right? The voltage is applied externally. We can tune it however we want. Um, so if we choose this to be true, then what happens is that a Cooper pair can tunnel by emitting K photons into the resonator. Right, so if these energies are, are not equal, then this um, 
tunneling is suppressed because, well, they simply don't have the same energy. But if we choose this, we make this process resonant with emitting K photons. So then this Hamiltonian will allow us to, to get this effect where we can have tunneling Cooper pairs by photo assisted, uh, well, by photo emission, or also by absorption of K photons, it could tunnel the other way. <coughs> okay, and now we can again look at the Schrodinger equation, but here I think it makes more sense to look at the von Neumann equation because we will deal with uh, mixed states uh, later on. And again, I will simply give you the solution of this. So again, it turns out that the Josephson junction is described by a well-defined phase. So we again have a phase eigenstate here. And the photons in the resonator, they are kind of, they, they're described by a different density matrix. So the total density matrix is a, is a tensor product between the photons in the resonator and this phase eigenstate, where we have the same phase as before, this time-dependent phase, 2 EV times T. Now, the photons are described by, by its own or by their own uh, von Neumann equation. Where we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So let me maybe... I'm not going to put an R here because in, in the following, this will kind of be the Hamiltonian that we're interested in. But this is now a Hamiltonian that only acts on the photonic subspace. So the tunneling Cooper pairs are kind of out of the picture. They're just described by this phase eigenstate. Okay, so the photons are described by this Hamiltonian here. And finally, let me express this, this flux operator also using ladder operators. Right, so this is very similar to kind of a position operator. It's the sum of A and A dagger uh, with some prefactor. And the prefactor here, well, is essentially determined by the impedance of the LC resonator. Okay, then finally, let me also know that, well, he, no, note that here we have the voltage that is tunable. And this phase offset can be tuned, well, in some architectures, or actually in this architecture, by a magnetic field. that kind of pierces this, this structure. So if you have a magnetic field going through this, the loop that the circuit designs, then this can, this can allow to tune this parameter. Okay, so let's pause here for a little while because I think what happens here is quite remarkable. So what we did is we looked at this structure, which is described by this Hamiltonian, and then we coupled it to this structure, which is simply described by a, uh, a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. 
And then we get um, this Hamiltonian, where the Cooper pairs pick up a phase when tunneling. So I didn't really derive this. Uh, this is discussed in much more detail in the first and third uh, reference, I would say. Um, so here you just have to believe me that this is what happens when you couple these things, that these Cooper pairs pick up an extra phase. <clears throat> and this phase is given by, well, the flux operator, which can be written as uh, the ladder operators, the sum of A and A dagger, essentially. And then when we, when we look at the von Neumann equation, then we realize that what's going to happen here is that the Josephson junction is still described by a well-defined phase. Uh, and, uh, and we can simply, we can essentially just deal with the photons in the resonator uh, alone. So we can deal with this still unitary von Neumann equation, where we now suddenly have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So this is an autonomous setup in the sense that we are not required to have any time-dependent control. It's a time-independent DC voltage that is applied. But by the physics of the Josephson junction, this allows us to create a time-dependent Hamiltonian for the photons. Um, and then we have these two different knobs. Uh, on the experimental side, we can change the voltage, which changes the, the frequency here. Uh, and we can change the magnetic field, which, which changes the phase here. Yes, are there any questions up to here? Okay, then let's uh, let's go on a little bit further before we before we have a break. So that now brings me to the main part of the lecture, which is about quantum thermal machines. Okay, and now we can, um, yeah, now we, we can go beyond this architecture. So it turns out with this architecture, we can already do interesting things, but we can now add multiple of these LC resonators and do interesting things as well. So let me kind of sketch three different architectures that we, we looked at in the past. Uh, the first one is actually the same that I already showed you. I'm here reproducing it for completeness. So we have a magnetic field and an external voltage. And what we looked at here is that this system can be operated as a work extractor. So if we have some, some density matrix of our photons, we can use this circuit to extract work from this state. And this work is then essentially given by electrical power. So for instance, we looked at Fox states or squeezed states in this, in this system, and it turns out that most of the, the energy stored in these states can be extracted in the form of work using the circuit and playing around with, magnetic and, uh, uh, with the magnetic and electric field, so with the voltage and the, and the magnetic field. So this still now is just a Hamiltonian, right? There's no thermal bath uh, at this point. So now what we also looked at and what we're going to look at in more detail in the second hour is a slightly more complicated setup where we have two LC resonators. Again, we have a, a voltage source here. And this we're going to look into more detail in the next hour because here we can now apply thermal bath. So we can have a cold bath here that kind of exchanges photons with one of the resonator and a hot bath here that exchanges photons with the other resonator. And then we can construct a heat engine where a heat flow from hot to cold drives a charge flow against the voltage. 
And this is, yeah, th this we're going to look at in more detail in the, in the next hour. And then we also looked at how this thing can be operated as a thermometer. Or essentially what it did is you need kind of a, if you have a bad thermometer, you can use this engine to turn it into a better thermometer here of the uh, either cold or the hot temperature. So usually we argue that it's the cold temperature that is harder to measure. So you could have uh, turned this into, or you could apply this as a thermometer for the cold temperature that is that couples to one of your LC resonators. Uh, and then we looked at a, at a third, even more complicated setup, where we have, as you might guess, three LC resonators. So you see a pattern. Here, actually, we didn't use a voltage source, but we did use a magnetic field. Uh, and then we have three thermal baths, a cold one, one that is at an intermediate temperature called room, and a hot temperature. Uh, and this can be Uh, implement well this implements an absorption refrigerator where the idea is that a heat flow from hot to room kind of drags out heat from the cold bath so you can cool down the coldest part of your system uh, using this heat bias or this temperature bias between hot and and room Okay, are there any any questions here up to here? Um, yes, that I will do in detail in the next hour. I think it would take a little too much time before the break. But yeah, we're going to look at it. We're, we're going to model it with master equations, as you've seen in the course. Maybe slightly different from what you've seen in the course, but we're... We're going to model them with master equations. Exactly. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, um, yes, you you can usually do that with a magnetic field. Um, with a magnetic field, you can you can kind of force the uh, the phase to take on a certain value. Exactly. So, so in general, people would say that in a superconductor, like the number of Cooper pairs is not well defined. You have the superposition of Cooper pairs. Now, if you have a single Cooper pair where phase doesn't really matter, uh, so you you can't really see the phase, then this description might not make too much sense, or you don't you don't really need this phase coherence. But when you have two different superconductors kind of coupled to each other, then this phase difference becomes a very well defined quantity. That can also be measured because, well, I mentioned the second Josephson relation, and the first Josephson relation relates the, the phase to the charge current, which can be measured. So then this, this phase does become a physical observable, even though it's kind of weird to think of them because these n eigenstates are certainly more intuitive for us to think about them. So here we really have this, this superposition of how many particles have already tunneled.
So you can also imagine you start with a well-defined number of Cooper pairs on the left and on the right, then one tunnels, maybe a second one tunnel, and then you, you build up superpositions of how many of them have tunneled until you kind of approximate this state. Of course, you're never, you're never going to really be there, but it will be a very good approximation at some point. Yes? Yes. So it seems to depend upon uh, in a good uh, number of uh, what was it very easy, large and uh, very poor groups. Exactly. Yes. So the superposition here really goes to infinity, and the phase is well defined. Now, if you force this operator to kind of be not to go all the way to infinity or minus infinity, then you can ha make like approximate phase eigenstates and you would get fluctuations in the phase still. So you wouldn't be in a phase eigenstate, but in some maybe Gaussian around some phase. And these fluctuations would then essentially result in voltage fluctuations, or be equivalent to voltage fluctuations across the junction. Um, and so that, in principle, should also be taken into account. But it turns out that often in these systems, these fluctuations can be neglected. And it's a good approximation too. But, but it's, it's kind of important to realize that we are, strictly speaking, do doing something unphysical here. So it should be seen as kind of an, appro uh, an approximation to what's really going on. So is it a strict, strictly speaking, like a trivial state, but then you just make it too strictly uh, with the right picture? Or is it that uh, if you just think that you want to go that way, or in a trivial state, more, more, more stable, then if you take two of them, and you just mean the approximation where you have like one plus tunnel, you, you can approximate for the whole web. No, so already for one superconductor, like this phase eigenstate, this coherent state, is an approximation where you are in a superposition of all different possible Cooper pair numbers. So that's already an approximation. So every real superconductor would have fluctuations around the phase. It wouldn't be in a phase eigenstate. But these are often negligible. So what do you mean by coherent state here? Exactly. We're not dealing with a harmonic oscillator here, but we're dealing with a, with a different object. It would have a lower bound and an upper bound, and that makes it more tricky. It's not the same as a coherent state in a harmonic oscillator. Uh, yes, it's still not it, not the same. It, it, it's it's very close. It's closely related, but it's it's not strictly speaking the same. Yeah. Okay, then I suggest that we have like a ten minute break. I think today we can have a little bit longer break because then we're there's no tutorial afterwards, and then we're gonna start at quarter two uh, again. Okay. Okay, let's get started again. Uh, maybe let me start by asking if there's any questions that came up during the break. If not, then let's, let's move on. Um, okay, so first we're going to look at the heat engine, which is sketched up there in the middle. So that's the architecture that we're going to look at. And now in the last hour, we looked at this idea of um, photo-assisted Cooper pair tunneling. Um, yes. So here the idea is that we are now going to set the voltage such that 2 EV equals the difference in the frequencies. And then the photo assisted Cooper pair tunneling happens like this. So we have our Cooper pairs to the left of the junction at chemical potential mu. We have the Cooper pairs on the right at chemical potential mu plus EV. Uh, and then a Cooper pair can tunnel against the voltage bias by absorbing a photon from the hot uh, reservoir or from the reservoir omega H. 
yeah, I should uh, actually probably put some frequencies in here. So this will be this frequency we call omega h, and this we call omega c, because now we're dealing with two harmonic oscillators or two LC circuits. And then the idea is that by absorbing a photon from the resonator coupled to the hot bath and emitting a photon into the res resonator coupled uh, to the cold bath, a Cooper pair can tunnel against the voltage bias. And when Cooper pairs tunnel against the voltage bias, that's electrical current flowing against the voltage bias, that's electrical power. Uh, so that's kind of the physical mechanism uh, that allows us to create power. And by having the LC resonators coupled to thermal bath, we make the occupation of the omega H LC resonator larger than that of the omega C. So we kind of favor this process with respect to the inverse process, which is also always present. Uh, yes, there was a question. So they do have different frequencies. We assume them to have different frequencies, exactly. The, the heat engine doesn't work if... Um, it's going to shift the frequency somewhat, uh, but we're going to assume that they're designed such that it, at the end their effective frequencies are equal to omega C and omega H. Only using the bath to create this imbalance is probably extremely difficult. Um, so what, like experimentally, one would design two different frequencies. They might be sli slightly shifted by the, um, by the, by the reservoirs then, uh, which is called the lamp shift. And at the end, we can tune our voltage such that this is given. So we don't need to have extremely good control over these frequencies. We just need them to be different. So, yeah, so how it's going to work, uh, so we're going to go through the math. But the idea is that the hot bath provides a lot of photons. And these photons can then be absorbed by the Cooper pairs in this process. And then photons are being emitted into the cold, reservoir, uh, cold resonator, so in the omega C resonator, and then they leave to the cold bath. So for a photon, the kind of trajectory that we want is that the photon starts in the bath TH, it enters omega H resonator, it is absorbed by a Cooper pair, which then emits an omega C photon, and that photon is evacuated to the cold bath. So ideally, we have lots of photons in omega H and no photons in omega C, such that we really drive this, this process and we don't get the reverse process. Um, OK, so let's first write down the Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is going to look very similar to, to what, we have, what we had here. But now we have two LC resonators. So it is a little bit more complicated. We have our omega C resonator. We have our omega H resonator. And then we have our Josephson uh, term. So the cosine um, we're going to absorb the theta zero into kind of a redefinition of time. We can also always shift our zero in time such that Theta zero drops out. And then we have different couplings, which are these lambdas. Okay, so this is now the Hamiltonian of the total thing. Um, it is time dependent because of this Josephson junction. Um, and now we can also, so let me put a head here, we can also introduce a power operator, which is the negative of the time derivative of the Hamiltonian. So the cosine becomes a sine.
And this is indeed simply the voltage times the electrical current operator. So the work here is accessible through the electrical current. So we can actually measure the current, and then we can we know the voltage, so then we, we can directly figure out what the power is, and because it's an electrical current, it could in principle also be used to charge a battery. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian, and now we want to describe also the thermal bath, and that we do using a master equation. So we're going to say our density matrix before I had this subscript R for resonators, I dropped this here. We're only always dealing with photons now. And I also drop uh, the time dependence of various quantities simply to keep the notation a little bit less bulky. And then we introduce here super operators for each bath. So we have one superoperator that describes the action of the cold bath, one superoperator that describes the action of the hot bath. And this, the superoperators, they look like this. So there's a coupling constant, which we call kappa. And then we have two terms. We have one term which corresponds to emitting to absorbing photons from the bath and one term that corresponds to emitting photons to the bath. And let me quickly write down what these quantities are. So NB is the Bose-Einstein distribution. And then this is another superoperator. Okay, so you see the this master equation, I mean, you need to introduce a few symbols and everything, but then it's relatively straightforward to understand what's going on. So it, everything is additive. So we add to the von Neumann equation of the closed system the terms that uh, describe the coupling to the bath. And now when we look at the coupling to a bath, it has two terms again. So this here describes the absorption of a photon that, that comes in from the bath. So this, is th this term here adds a photon uh, to your system. And for this to happen, you need, uh, well, this happens here with this prefactor of the Bose-Einstein distribution. So this tells us about how many photons there are in the bath. So the more photons there are in the bath, the more likely it is that we're going to absorb a photon from the bath. Uh, so this is absorption. And then this here describes emission to the bath. And there's spontaneous emission, so we can just emit something into the bath. But there's also um, stimulated emission. So the more photons there are in the bath, the more likely it becomes that we emit something to the bath. Uh, so, so these are these, uh, these, different, these different terms. Okay, and this master equation now looks still quite horrible because we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, which is an extremely nonlinear beast. Um, but now we can simplify things a lot by doing a rotating wave approximation. <coughs> so, so essentially we're gonna go to a rotating frame 
Yes. I just wanted to start out with you know the, the, the ratio of the Fermenti concept of two two groups of like two two groups of people growing their own plant based organic to two groups of people growing their own plant based organic. Yes. So this is an important property. Absolutely. So this ensures that we end up in a Gibbs state if we would just have one, yeah, if we would just have one harmonic oscillator um, coupled to one bath, then this kind of dissipator ensures that we end up in a Gibbs state because we have this ratio, exactly. That's a very, very good point. Okay, so the rotating frame um, is essentially simply a time-dependent unitary transformation of our density matrix. And if we do a time-dependent unitary, then the Hamiltonian has to be adapted slightly differently. Right, so if you take the time derivative of this object, you do get time derivatives of u, and that's why the Hamiltonian has to be uh, transformed like this, such that the von Neumann equation is still given in the usual way with this uh, rotating Hamiltonian. Um. Okay, so that's the first step. Um, yeah, that's the first step here. Go to a rotating frame. And the unitary that does this looks as follows. So it's this time-dependent unitary. Okay, and then what we find is that the Hamiltonian in the rotating frame is given by the following quantity. So we have an exponential and essentially all the a daggers get this e to the i omega c t and the a's get e to the i minus i omega t under this transformation and then we have a similar thing for the Omega H resonator. And then this is actually just one part uh, of the Hamiltonian. So we do have the Hermitian conjugate of, of, of all of that as well. And so this is the first step. So we just go to this rotating frame. So we haven't really changed anything. The problem is still as complicated as it was before, just in a different frame. Um, so now we expand these exponentials. And the rotating wave approximation uh, is to drop all the terms that are then still time dependent. So we only keep time independent terms. 
So right now, this resonance condition is extremely important. So you see, when you expand the exponential, you will get exponentials of i omega c t, uh, of i omega h t, and then these can cancel with this uh, two e v uh, times t whenever, whenever something like this occurs. And when you do all this, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna go through that. But then we find that the Hamiltonian in this rotating frame looks as follows. And here we have some complicated operator. Okay, so we have annihilation of a photon in omega h, creation of a photon in omega c, and some nonlinear term which doesn't create or annihilate any photons. So this is diagonal in the photon number basis. It just gives kind of different weights uh, to these terms, uh, depending on how many photons there are. But this is exactly what we want to describe here. Annihilation of an omega H photon, creation of an omega C photon. Um, and then, of course, we also have the term that we don't want, which does exactly the inverse. Oh, yes. So for completeness, I'm going to write down this big A operator, even though I would say it doesn't matter too much here. But to kind of give you a flavor what kind of objects appear in these photo-assisted Cooper pair tunnelings, because it turns out you can do quite a, a lot of interesting things with those, but here we're just going to be interested in the fact that you remove one type of photon and create another type of photon. So these are log air polynomials, which appear here. Oh, and then there are squares here. But then, as I mentioned, they are diagonal in the photon number basis. So these are, well, let me also write this out for completeness, that if we have these are the eigenstates of the photon number operators. OK, and this is now much more simple. And we can even make it even more simple by choosing a limit where these couplings are small. So if we choose these couplings to be small, uh, so they're related to the impedance of the circuits, uh, but if we choose these couplings to be small, then we essentially get a beam splitter coupling. where g, the coupling constant here is 2 lambda c lambda h times the Josephson energy. Okay, so this is kind of the technical part that we had to do to simplify our master equation. Yes? Yeah, exactly. So that's the trick that we did here, right? So we say that the Cooper pairs are essentially described by this phase eigenstate. Uh, and then we have, we have this here. If you would keep the Cooper pairs, what would happen is you would get here a e to the i theta and here a e to the minus i theta. Not entirely sure about the sign now. Um, and, and remember, these are the tunneling terms. So these are Cooper pairs tunneling to the left or to the right, and this is the other direction. So you, you then if you keep track of the Cooper pairs, you really see how a Cooper pair tunnels by absorbing a photon like this and emitting a photon like that. But if it's in a phase eigenstate, we can just remove the e to the i theta. So we're just gonna just gonna erase that again. Yes? No, so this is a log air polynomial.
So this is, these are just numbers which depend on these ends. Uh, this here is a super operator which acts on your matrix and gives you a different matrix. Yes? Yeah, so this, this is usually called a beam splitter coupling um, because that's how a beam splitter acts. If you come in from one side, you... Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so I don't usually describe beam splitters with Hamiltonians. I use different formalisms. And that I'm actually not entirely sure. I mean, the beam splitter, strictly speaking, has two inputs and two outputs. Um, but under certain circumstances, you must be able to, to describe it with this. And so you turn one mode into another and this mode into, into that. I guess the idea is that you say you say uh, that you come in with AC and with AH, and then if you go through, you're still in AH, and here you're in, still in AC, and then if you come in with AH, you turn into a, something like that. But yeah, let me erase that again because it's not going to be helpful for us here. Yes. So the ability to couple to the thermal bath yeah. okay. is you don't need a Josephson junction for that. Okay. So you can simply have a, a resonator. Uh, yeah. Simply a resonator like this, and you can excite it. By at high temperatures, it will be excited. Okay. It will have you can populate it with photons. Usually, I mean these thermal baths that I that I describe here, you would you would have some transmission lines that that are going here that that bring some white noise to your uh, to your resonator. Photons in this case, well, yeah, but microwave you know, photons. I, I cover it with the thermal reservoir, right? And yes. How the, the mechanism by which you populate the resonator then, once it becomes a thermal kinetic energy source, that then excites the solid state material out of which the resonator is made, I think it's the same thing. Right? So you can just say, okay, you can also put these photons, but if we are talking about thermal resonators. Yeah. It's not necessarily kinetic energy here. Um, so, I mean, you can also couple a qubit to a thermal reservoir, and then your qubit, might, there might not be such a thing as kinetic energy. You can just excite it or de-excite it. So in this picture, the idea is that in this microwave transmission line, you have thermal noise, and that noise couples to, to this resonator. So that's as if you, you could also coherently drive the system with the uh, photons, but instead of coherently having a coherent drive in here, you have thermal thermal noise, yeah, white noise coming in. Exactly, but I'm talking about the, the origin of this thermal noise. Yeah, it's voltage fluctuations at the end. You you apply some voltage fluctuation somewhere, you get a thermal noise in this in this transmission line. Yes. Uh, sorry, where? So here there's a dagger, right? Here there's a dagger. And the, the capital A is Hermitian. So this is Hermitian. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me see. Yeah, let's also look what happens to the power operator when we go through all of this. Um, because that's going to be an important quantity. And then the technical part is kind of going to be over, and we're going to look at how this thing actually performs as a heat engine. 
And it turns out that we can solve quite a few things without actually solving the master equation, which for these nonlinear operators is still a pain. Uh, yes? Uh, it's right here. I was just in time. So when you have this here, um, then this guy, let me see, is equal to 2 lambda a plus a dagger. And then the lambda is written in terms of the impedance. So the lambda, you can think of it as a, as a coupling constant, how good the photons couple to the Josephson junction. And it, it's determined physically by the impedance of, of the resonators. Yeah, we would, it's kind of a low impedance limit or a small coupling limit. You then also see that this, the chi will also be small. So it will be a small coupling limit. So if, if your coupling is small, then all these nonlinear terms don't matter. Uh, and it's also kind of a natural limit because creating like, like large impedance resonators is not so easy. I think by now people kind of routinely do it, but uh, for a long time it was quite difficult to. So this I think I will keep. Um, and yeah, then let's look at the power operator here as well. So we, we can do the, the same story, go to this rotating frame with the power operator. And we will find something very similar. Oh, sorry. So there's the Josephson energy. And then there is A dagger C, big A, A, H plus. No, no, it's a minus. And again, we can take a very the same limit and simplify this to So in the good thing with this limit is then everything is, as we say, bilinear. Um, so you have one creation and one annihilation operator in every term, and then you can solve the problem exactly. Okay, so now to see how this, uh, how this object now performs as a heat engine, we can look at the time evolution of the photons. So now what we can do is we can look at the time derivative of A dagger H, A H. So this is equal to the trace A dagger H, A H, time derivative of rho. And then we can plug the master equation in here, right? So we have the master equation up there, so we know what time derivative of rho looks like. We can plug this in here um, do a lot of simplifications, well, or I mean, just some kind of kind of rearrange the terms, and we will get one term from the Hamiltonian, and this term can be shown relatively straightforward. That it's essentially the average power divided by two eV. So here I, I drop the, the rotating index. In principle, you, can, you should do this, these equations in a rotating frame. You can also do them in a non-rotating frame. You should get the same thing. But in a rotating frame, it's, it's much easier. Um, OK. So here we get that the, the number of photons changes because of two terms. One of those is related to the average power. So this is how the number of photons changes because Cooper pairs absorb these photons or emit these photons. And then the second one will look like this. So this is how the number of photons changes due to the thermal bath. And this is this, we will interpret this as the heat current 
divided by the energy of the photons. Right here we looked at not how the energy changed, but how the photon number changed. So this is the, the photon flux due to this reservoir. Um, and this will be equal to kappa h mbh minus a dagger h a h. So we have this very simple kind of expression that you get from these local and blood master equations that the heat current is essentially determined by the difference of photons in the bath and photons in the cavity. If there's more photons in the bath than in the cavity, the heat flows into the system. If there's more photons in the cavity than in the bath, he, photons will flow out of the system. Okay, and now we assume that we have a steady state. So if we wait for a long time, then the density matrix will tend to a steady state. So the time derivative of the density matrix will go to zero. It will become a, a static state. Um, so we can put this here to zero, um, which means we can put this left-hand side here to zero. And then we find directly that the heat current is given by omega h divided by 2 eV times the power. Uh, so now I simply call this p, the average of, of the power operator. And in a very similar equation or calculation, one can calculate that the heat current associated with cold bath is given by this. Okay, so these can be interpreted in a quite a simple way, right? So these are the number of Cooper pairs that tunnel, the power divided by 2 eV, right? That's just the number of Cooper pairs that tunnel. Uh, and each Cooper pair will remove a photon here from the hot bath by this Hamiltonian. You only get Cooper pair tunneling by removing a photon. Uh, that's what the rotating wave approximation kind of ensures. <clears throat> and then these are the photons that come into the, into the system from the bath. And what this now tells us that for each photon, for, on average, each photon that enters the bath, that enters from the bath, results in a Cooper pair tunneling, and then in another photon leaving the bath. Of course, there can be photons which enter and leave right away, but they don't contribute to the average heat current anyway, because they... They first enter, uh, adding heat, and then they leave, removing the same heat, so they, they drop out of this. But each photon that enters and doesn't come back has to result in a tunneling Cooper pair and then in another photon leaving on the, on the other side. Um, so physically... You see that from this Hamiltonian, right, that when you absorb a photon from the H resonator, well, it will appear in the C resonator. So the Cooper pairs always absorb one photon from H and emit one in C when they tunnel in one direction. Uh, and so if you have an extra electron that... So on average, this is the process that you have to look at, that this, this is what happens. A photon comes from the hot bath, enters the omega H resonator, is absorbed and then leaves the cold bath, and then you're again in the same state as you were before. So, for the if you just look at the averages, it's these. The, this is the process that happens on average, and then on average, each photon that enters uh, kind of has to leave on the other side. So that's also one one kind of important point of this Hamiltonian is that the total number of photons in the system is conserved. So you can't destroy or create photons in the system, the photons, they either have to uh, come or leave from the thermal bath. That's the only way that you change the total photon number here. You don't have a, a, a sink or a source of photons in the system. Okay, now a very important quantity to characterize heat engines is uh, the efficiency. And the efficiency is defined as the ratio between the power 
and the heat current. So loosely speaking, <coughs> the power is the output that we want. And the heat current from the hotbed is our resource. So the efficiency tells us how much power do we get out uh, given the resource that we consumed. And well, we get a very simple expression for this already from, from these equations here. We find that this here is simply 2 EV divided by omega h, which is just 1 minus omega c divided by omega h. And this is actually the same as the Otto efficiency in an Otto cycle. Even though we don't have a cycle here, we have kind of a steady state conversion of heat to work, but it looks exactly the same as the Otto efficiency. Uh, and essentially what it tells us is that for each, well, for each photon, we, we get this heat, omega h, and we produce this amount of work, 2 eV. Um, that, that, that's essentially what, what this equation tells us. And it's quite remarkable that we can kind of get this far because we, we didn't solve this equation, right? We just were able to relate power and heat current here. Uh, but we, we can solve this equation with the nonlinear part, actually. Uh, but this, nevertheless, is true for this Hamiltonian, even if we can't actually solve the dynamics. <clears throat> okay, and then what we can also look at is the entropy production. So the entropy production in the steady state is given by these Clausius terms. So the heat current that enters the reservoir divided by the temperature of the reservoir. Here, heat current is defined to be positive when it leaves the reservoir. That's why we have the minus signs. Um, and this we can rewrite, again, using the same expressions from before in this way. And the second law of thermodynamics tells us that this has to be positive. And this now gives us a condition for when do we actually get power out of this machine. So we know that this, this product has to be positive. So the power is positive if and only if the term in the brackets is positive. So we get that the power is bigger or equal to zero for and this is actually equivalent to having a higher occupation in the hot bath than in the cold bath. <coughs> yes. So this is a kappa h, uh, nbh, and then the average of the number operator. Exactly, yeah. The stronger the coupling, the bigger the heat current uh, in general. Yes. Um, OK, and now we can actually plug this condition kind of back into here. And what we then find is that the efficiency is bounded from above. So assuming that we need to have positive power, otherwise the efficiency doesn't really make sense anyway. So then what we get is that this is bounded from above by the Carnot efficiency. So also in regular thermodynamics, that's a very kind of fundamental result that the second law implies that a heat engine can only be as efficient as the Carnot engine. Um, and actually, at that point, we get equality when we reach this efficiency, and then we actually get zero power out. Yes? Uh, um, yes, there are two, ex well, there are different experiments that have implemented this, of course, first, and also this system. They didn't implement it yet with a temperature bias, so they didn't use it as a heat engine. But you can turn it around and use it to cool down 
one of the modes, and that makes also sense if you have equal temperatures, and that has been done uh, before. Yeah, you need a temperature bias for the heat engine. You really need, I mean, you need this condition. No, you can have a refrigerator even if you have equality. So what you, well, sorry, yeah, 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 you reverse this. So if you have equal temperatures, then general, in general, um, you will reverse this inequality because we assume that omega H is bigger than omega C, right? Yes. <clears throat> Okay, then let me write down the last thing, maybe um, that for lambda much smaller than one, we can actually solve everything exactly. And then we do get something that agrees with everything that we have written up, up here. So then we get that the power is actually directly proportional to this difference in both the Einstein occupations. So for this kind of linear model, we can solve everything, everything exactly. And now we're almost done. I'm just going to write down some conclusions. So the first conclusion is that superconductors that you might already know from, from different lectures or for diff different experience you had, are very promising for quantum technology uh, because the low energy degrees of freedom can be engineered. So we do have this space below the gap to kind of play around with to put in the excitations that, that we want. And that's, of course, not only interesting for quantum thermodynamics, but it's also what lies in the heart of, of using superconductors to make excellent qubits and to use them for different applications in quantum technology. And the second one is this photo-assisted Cooper pair tunneling. Um, this provides a very versatile platform for quantum thermodynamics and also for other applications, as you can see by these three examples up there. Okay, are there any questions left? So then let me thank you for your attention and I will stick around if you, if you want to uh, ask further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.